Welcome to ENV 101 Introduction to Environmental Science. This is the first of a series of audio lectures that I have provided for you to help you with the concepts of this class. And so let's begin. Today's topic is Introduction to Environmental Science. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at some topics that are going to pop up again and again and again in this class. And so let's begin. And let's first begin by defining what environmental science is. Environmental science is what is known as an interdisciplinary science. What that means is it's actually a collection of all of these different sciences. And so in this class, we are going to be talking about um, some of the natural sciences like chemistry, physics, biology, geology, atmospheric sciences. But environmental science is unique in that it also includes the social sciences. We're going to be looking at geography, economics. By the end of this class, you're going to be tired of me saying it all comes down to money. Think about it, guys. You make hundreds of decisions every day. What is really at the core of most of your decisions is can I afford this? The same thing is true about environmental science. We're going to talk about politics, and unfortunately, there are going to be some issues that come up with this class that are going to be viewed through a political spectrum. Uh, for example, when we talk about things like energy, Republicans have a very different stance on energy than Democrats do. And so we will be bringing up politics as well in this class, sociology and law. Here's the important part of this class, guys. Natural resources, and I know I haven't defined what those are. I'm going to here in a minute. And human resource. A human resource is anything that man makes. They are forever intertwined. You cannot separate them, guys. So what nature provides and what we make from those resources can never be separated. Now, let's talk about what a natural resource is. So a natural resource is any material or substance provided by the natural environment for us to use. Now, we divide natural resources into two major types, non-renewable natural resources and renewable natural resources. Now, non-renewable natural resources are finite in quantity. There's a limited amount of them, and so we will run out of those natural resources sometime in the future. Examples of this would be, think of our fossil fuels. We don't have an infinite supply of, gold, of coal or of oil or of natural gas. Uh, mineral resources, once again, we don't have an infinite supply of gold or silver or aluminum. And in this, I have also included fresh water. Now, some of you might be looking at me funny, and saying, well, fresh water, it's raining, and so we're adding water to the system. That is true, ladies and gentlemen, but think of it this way, okay? What is the one thing that each of you needs every day? It's not food. It's not sleep. It's fresh, potable drinking water. And so here's the problem, guys. We use fresh water much faster than it can be replenished naturally. And so I know fresh water looking at it as a non-renewable natural resource might be weird, but it really is because we use it much faster than it can be resupplied to us. Now the renewable natural resources, these are things that can be replenished again and again and again and again. They're, I, I don't want to use the word infinite, but there's a lot of it around. Uh, for example, when we get to energy resources, we're going to talk about renewable energy sources like solar, like wind, like geothermal. Uh, trees and plants. We can clear cut a forest, guys, but can't we replant it? Yeah. And then agricultural crops and livestock. We can slaughter a million cows, but can't we breed a million more? Yes, we can. And so these are renewable natural resources. Now, if we look at those two lists, which do you think are more important to us, non-renewable or renewable natural resources? And let me ask this question this way, guys. What is the entire global economy built on? I'll give you a minute to think about that. Okay? Give up? 
It's oil, ladies and gentlemen. So when we look at which of those is more important, it's the non-renewables, it's the fossil fuels, it's the mineral, it's the fresh water. Those are by far much more important than our renewable natural resource. Now, it all comes down to sustainability. This entire class, guys, the key concept, the core concept of environmental science is sustainability. Now, here's how I want to define this. Sustainability is simply this idea that the environment can meet the needs of the current generation, that's us, without sacrificing the needs of future generations. So we can supply for those people that are here now without compromising the needs of future generations that are not present. Now, in order to be sustainable, we have to accept one simple principle, guys. Most of the natural resources that we depend on are not infinite in supply. And therefore, we have to establish practices to reduce their consumption so that they're around for future generations. And this we're going to talk about in a couple minutes is what conservation all is all about the protection or management of those finite natural resources. Now, in order to be sustainable, we have to strike a balance between what are called the three spheres of sustainability. We have to strike a balance between the environment, the economy. See, we can never get past that, guys. Economics is very important to us. And the social system. Now, let me try to explain the social system as this. Each of you has a unique view on how you look at the world. Think about some of the things that influence that viewpoint, guys. Okay? Your age would do it. Okay? I'm probably a lot older than, than a lot of you, and therefore I would have a different viewpoint than you would. Gender. Okay? Think about it. Men and women don't look at the world the same way. Religion sexual orientation, income. Think about it, guys. Does Bill Gates look at the world the same way that we do? No. Okay. Education, how much education you get plays a role. Okay. So all of these different factors, age, ethnicity, income, education, religion, sexual orientation, gender, all of these things, each characteristic that makes you unique is what we call the social system. And so all of those kind of have this, this influence on how you view the world. And so in order to be sustainable, we have to strike a balance between these three spheres. And so this is where we want to be, guys, this inner orange part of this Venn diagram, this is where sustainability lies, where we strike a balance between the environment, between the economy, and between the social system. Now, sustainability is a buzzword that is used a lot, although most of the time when it's used, most businesses you'll say, well, yeah, we're sustainable. Well, no, they're not, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, It's hard to strike a balance between those three things. Now, the other major obstacle sustainability is our very nature. And this was brought up by a man named Hardin back in 1968. He wrote a now very famous paper on something that he called the tragedy of the commons. What Hardin realized was that every day there's a struggle going on between the individual welfare and the welfare of the society that houses that individual. And so this is what Hardin said, guys. Here's what tragedy common is. That every day the individual will sacrifice the long-term good of the society to satisfy their immediate short-term needs. Okay? I want you to think about it this way, guys. Okay? Sometime today you're going to get hungry. What do you do? You eat something. When you eat something, are you thinking about the well-being of Las Vegas 50 years from now? Of course you're not. Okay? You're thirsty. What do you do? You drink something. 
once again, when you drink something, are you thinking about how Las Vegas will be 50 years from now? No, you're not. Okay? You see a really cute pair of leather boots. What do you do? If you got the money, you buy them. Okay? We make hundreds of decisions every single day. Most of those decisions, I would say maybe 90, 95% of them, are all designed for one thing to satisfy your immediate short-term needs okay now there are those actions that you take that are actually looking at the societal well-being okay for those of you that recycle okay if you recycle something you are thinking about the well-being of Las Vegas 50 years from now for those of you that volunteer time or money to a charity you're also thinking about the welfare of the society but let's be honest ladies and gentlemen that is a very small part of your daily activities most of what you are trying to do is consume okay we from a young age guys we grow up in a consumer driven society where we are taught at a very young age to consume 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 when you were kids what was your favorite holiday guys Okay, it was Christmas. Why? Because you got things from Santa. Okay, that's this consumer driven society. And so here's what Harden is saying that we can never be sustainable because it goes against our very nature. In order to be sustainable, we need to put things aside for future generations. We don't do that well, guys. Now, Let's go back to kind of the second half of sustainability. In order to be sustainable, you have to have conservation. Conservation and sustainability go hand in hand, guys. And so what conservation is, I always like to define it in one word, save. Okay? Conservation means you're going to save something or you're going to protect something so that it's going to be around 20, 40, 100 years from now. You have to have conservation if you're going to be sustainable guys once again we have to accept that fact that most of our natural resources are not infinite and therefore we have to put something aside now the modern conservation movement actually began in the early 20th century by teddy roosevelt what he did was he signed the national monuments act in 1906 now, most of you may not realize that, but most of you probably have heard of, of, we generally think it's the National Parks Act. Well, that's what that is, was, guys. The National Monuments Act set aside tracts of land for people to enjoy in the future. And so that really was the start of the modern conser conservation movement. Now... I know, once again, this is probably not unlike any other science class that you've had before, but we have to talk about economics, guys. Very, very important in environmental science. Now, there are literally hundreds of definitions of economics out there. What I have given you is the one that I like the best. Okay, When you strip away everything, supply and demand, uh, capitalism versus communism, uh, socialism, when you strip away uh, the markets, the gold standard, the dollar, really when it comes down to it, guys, economics is really the study of how you use your limited resources to satisfy your needs. Once again, dozens of decisions every day. At the basis, at the core of those decisions is probably money. Okay, You might think to yourself, well, if I, be, if I buy that, that uh, cute pair of leather boots, I might have to eat ramen for the rest of the month. That is really what economics is all about, guys. How you choose to use your limited resources. Now, here's the important thing, guys. When dealing with any economy, I don't care what country it is, you have to put a value on any product that is brought into an economy. We're going to take a look at this here in a couple minutes, okay? But anything that is incorporated into an economy has to have a price. This is also going to lead us to a problem a little bit later on, guys. Now, when you talk about price, 
you need to talk about a very fundamental principle of economics called supply and demand. Now think of it this way, guys. Let's think of it logically. Let's say you had your eye on a new um, sofa. And all of a sudden, that sofa doubles in price. What are you going to do, guys? You're going to say, no thanks, I don't need it right now, and you're going to wait. So as price goes up, the demand, how much people are willing to buy that product, goes down, which then causes an increase in supply because nobody's buying that product. Okay. The other way, let's say once again, we go back to that sofa and all of a sudden it's 25% off. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to buy it. You're going to clamor for it because you think you're getting a good deal. So you lower the price of a product, the demand goes up and the supply goes down. And so you often have to produce more to keep up with the demand. Um, whenever I think of supply and demand, guys, I always think of Black Friday. Why do people actually get in line on Thanksgiving, the Thursday of Thanksgiving, for stores that don't open until 6 or 7 the next day? Is because they think they're getting a good price. You can get a 50-inch flat screen for 100 bucks. Okay, This is supply and demand, guys. You lower the price far enough, we think we're getting a great deal, the demand will go up and we want it okay this is the basis of Black Friday guys now here's another important um, part about environmental science every single economy guys depends on the natural environment to supply them with raw materials okay think about it guys we can go down the list of every any country and what they sell on the open market are going to be natural resources. Okay, let's take a few examples. Saudi Arabia, what natural resources is their economy built on? Oil. Okay, what about our neighbors to the north, guys? Canada. Okay, don't say hockey or maple syrup. It's actually lumber. They have a thriving lumber. And uh, what about us, guys? The U.S. What do we sell the most of on the open market? Well, it's agricultural products, guys. What does oil and timber and agricultural products all have in common? They're natural resources, guys. Things supplied by the natural environment for us to use. Now, here's the distinction between a natural resource and a natural resource that's incorporated into an economy. As soon as you bring a natural resource into an economy and you put a price tag on it it ceases to be a natural resource and is now called natural capital these are once again resources provided by the natural environment from which we make things from now let me give you a couple examples of this guys and I actually have one here on the slide think about all the trees up on Mount Charleston those are natural resources. We cut those trees down. We make two by fours from them. Now those two by fours, they have a price on them. Now they're natural capital. Okay. Let me give you another example. Let's say that we have a, a oil deposit somewhere out there. That oil is a natural resource. When we find it, we extract it. We refine it to make gasoline that gasoline is now natural capital. The resource has been brought into an economy, a price tag has been put on it, and we then buy and sell these things. Okay, So I hope you understand the difference. Natural resource is anything that, that the, the natural environment provides for us. As soon as we take that natural resource, we bring it into an economy, we put a price tag on it, now it's natural capital. Now, we're going to take a little side trip here, guys. I know we were just talking about economics, and you may see that I'm going off in a completely different direction, but there's a reason we're taking this trip, guys. Eventually, we're going to work our way back to economics. But before we do, we need to introduce a concept that is going to be with us all throughout this semester, an ecosystem. 
And an ecosystem is defined as a combination of all the living organisms in a particular environment plus the physical environment that they occupy. So let's say that we take the Las Vegas Valley as our ecosystem, guys. That would include all the living organisms in the valley plus everything that isn't living, soil and rocks and climate. Now, every ecosystem has two parts to it. There is a biotic portion that would be the living portion. Whenever you see the prefix B-I-O, you should always think life, guys. And you also have the abiotic portion. So that would be everything that isn't living. Okay, so once again, if we take the Las Vegas Valley, the biotic portion would include all the humans, the cacti, the black widows, these lizards, snakes, everything that's living. But it would also have the abiotic portion, the rocks, the soil, the climate, everything else. Now here's why this is important. Energy and matter are continually cycled between the biotic and abiotic portion. And let me give you the best example right here, guys. Right now, what are you breathing in? Oxygen, right? From the atmosphere. That would be the abiotic portion, yes? So the oxygen starts in the atmosphere. You breathe it in. It's now part of the biotic portion. You then give off or breathe out carbon dioxide gas. That's the best example, guys how we're actually taking, in this case, matter. We're taking oxygen, breathing it in, breathing out carbon dioxide. That's an example of one of these cycling between the biotic and abiotic portions. Now, here's where we were getting to, guys. Something called an ecosystem service. These are resources or processes supplied by natural ecosystems usually as a result of the cycling of energy and matter between the biotic and abiotic portions. Okay, So eventually we're going to take this concept of ecosystem services and we're going to work it back toward economics. But before we do that guys, I want to take a look at the four main groups of ecosystem services. We have provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural services. Now let's take the first one, provisioning. If you guys have never heard that word before, provision means to provide. So generally provisioning services are going to provide us with something tangible. Gold, oil, uh, wood, uh, fish, game. Anything where we get a tangible good out of it, out of it is going to be a provisioning services. We would also consider energy production guys once again when we get to energy we'll talk about renewables like solar wind and geothermal those would also be provisioning services okay because it the environment is giving us something now regulating services these are services that help regulate most of earth's systems or cycles that operate on earth for example guys we have hundreds uh, actually thousands of parts or components that work together or work in opposition of one another to provide us with the climate that we see here on earth okay also another example would be waste decomposition think about it guys everything that dies rots it decomposes because of the action of bacteria or other decomposers okay these are things that help regulate these processes that are operating on Earth. The third group are supporting services. Now, this is a little bit harder to understand, but let's look at it this way, guys. Okay, there are something called nutrient cycles. These are the cycling of elements through an ecosystem. And I want to take one in particular, something called the nitrogen cycle, which is the cycling of nitrogen through an ecosystem. Plants absolutely need nitrogen in certain forms in order to grow, reproduce, and do what they have to do. Without that nitrogen cycle, guys, which once again would be classified as a supporting service, plant life wouldn't exist on 
earth. Therefore, we call them supporting services because they support biological functions or other functions. Okay. The last one are cultural services. For example, there are certain Indian tribes uh, that think there are certain areas where they can commune with their ancestors. Those would be like spiritual benefits. Or we could also talk about recreational benefits. I know most of you have probably gone swimming in, in Lake Mead or the Colorado River. Did you use that ecosystem, in this case that water, you did. That would be a cultural ecosystem service. So once again, guys, an ecosystem service is either a good or process that is supplied by the natural environment, usually as a result of cycling of energy and material between the biotic and abiotic portion of an ecosystem. Okay. Now, let's finally work this all the way back to economics, guys. Remember I said earlier that everything that is brought into an economy has to have a price. You have to, guys. Okay. We know how much a ton of lumber is. We know how much a barrel of oil is. We know how much an ounce of silver is. Okay, Those are what are called market goods. They have set prices in the market. Here's the problem, guys, is that in a lot of cases, we have to bring in an ecosystem service into the economy. And there is no set price for these things. These are what are called non-market or non-monetary goods and services. Okay? Oil is a market good, guys. Set price. But think of it this way. Clean air. What is clean air worth to you? Okay? If I asked all of you how much a, a barrel of oil is, you'd give me one answer, whatever it is on today's market. But if I asked each of you how much clean air is worth to you, I'd get all different answers, guys. That's what these non-market or non-monetary uh, ecosystem services are. And I know what you're thinking. Well, why do we have to bring them into an economy and put a price tag on them? We do, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? We just have to accept we're going to bring them in. A price has to be determined on essentially things that are priceless. Okay? This is the biggest obstacle to any economy, guys built on natural capital is how do you value these non-market or non-monetary ecosystem services. Now, there are several different methods that are used. I believe your book mentions several of these, like hedonistic pricing. Um, what I want to talk about is the one that is most widely used because it's the easiest to understand. And it's something called the contingent valuation or CV method. What we do is we actually develop surveys in which you go out and ask people how much they would be willing to pay in either voluntary donations or monthly or yearly taxes for these specific environmental services. The reason it's called contingent is because what people will respond. The numbers that they will give you will be based on the hypothetical scenario that you set up. Okay? Let me give you an example of this. Let's say there we have two survey givers. Okay? Two people that are designing these surveys and they're both after the same ecosystem service. The first one researches the topic for months. They he or she knows it um, backwards, forwards, in and out. Okay? And they come up with a very crystal clear question that when you're asked, you know exactly what they're talking about. And so that first survey giver is going to collect a series of data points. Okay? Good data, guys. Now, the second survey giver doesn't do any research. They come up with a question five minutes before they go ask people. It's horribly worded, it's confusing, it's so bad you actually get a little bit dumber when you hear it, guys. That's how bad it is. Now they're going to go out and ask people. People are going to give them values. Are those values worth anything? No, they're garbage, guys. I don't know if you've ever heard of the acronym GIGO, 
garbage in, garbage out. So what we have are two data sets. Now, both survey givers are going to present them as good, valid data. But really, only the first set is valuable. The second set is garbage, guys. But that survey giver is not going to say that. And so here's the problem with this CV method, guys. It's the, it's the most straightforward. It's the easiest to understand. It's the easiest to implement. But it has serious problem associated with it especially if your hypothetical scenarios aren't well designed. Now, let me give you um, a couple examples here, guys, of a good and a bad survey question, okay? So let's start with the bad. Let's say that you have a survey giver that comes up to you and asks, how much would you pay for clean air? If somebody did that to me, guys, I'd, I'd ask them, well, what do you mean by clean air? What's your standard of clean? It's vague, isn't it, guys? But what happens if somebody came up to you and asked you this question? How much would you be willing to pay to reduce carbon dioxide levels in Las Vegas by 50% over the next five years? That's a much clearer question, isn't it, guys? Usually a good CV question has three things. Has a quantity has a time limit and has a location. Notice the good question, guys. What was the quantity? We were going to reduce CO2 levels by 50%. What was our time limit over the next five years? And where was our location? In Las Vegas. So that's, yes, this is the most widely used, guys, but it has some serious consequences to it depending on the survey and how it's set up. Now, let's talk a little bit about environmental policy. And what policy is, is simply the principles that guide the actions of companies, of individuals, or even of governments on environmental issues. Now, generally, if you have these policies, you're going to have goals, okay? Um, I'm gonna, we're going to set out a policy to reach a certain goal. Now, these goals can be achieved in several ways. First off, regulation. Okay, You want people to stop polluting the atmosphere. You set laws limiting how much air pollution they can produce. You give incentives to encourage certain behaviors. Okay, You want people to recycle more? Give them money, guys, and they'll start recycling more. Uh, you can set up partnerships. Let's say that we have a company that takes old tires and breaks them down into raw materials. We have a second company that, I don't know if you've ever seen those, those rubber mats at playgrounds across the valley. Those are actually made from recycled tires, guys. So one company recycles the tires, another company makes the mats. Wouldn't it make sense for them to form a partnership? Of course it would, guys. Or you can ask for volunteers, okay? People that aren't going to get paid but are still going to try to help you achieve your goals. Now, generally speaking, in environmental science, guys, we use what are called market-based policies. They're the most common, the most widely used, and they use a combination of both regulation and incentives, okay? Now, I have a great example of this. If you've ever heard of cap-and-trade policies, let's take a look at carbon credits guys okay let's say that we own a business let's say we own a dry cleaning facility guys okay we go into business together now the EPA has come in and said okay based on your size of operation this is how much air pollution units you can generate in a year let's say it's a hundred guys okay so they come in and they say you can generate a hundred um, units of air pollution now we have a choice as a business we can go green. We can buy the latest technology that is actually going to produce less pollution. Okay, It's going to cost us money up front, guys, but let's say we do that. And at the end of the first year, we've only produced 50 units of air pollution, where the EPA said we could produce 100. Guess what we can do with those extra 50 units, guys? We can turn around and we can sell them on the open market. 
This is what cap and trade means. So you set caps on businesses of how much they can generate, but those businesses, if they go under, they can trade or essentially sell their unused units on the open market. And so what we see a lot of the smaller or medium-sized businesses, guys, they'll go green, they'll buy the latest technology, they'll produce less than what they were afforded, and therefore they then have an incentive, an economic incentive to do that because they can sell those unused ones on the open market. That's what we would call market-based policies. So you use regulation and incentives to achieve your goal. Now, when it comes to environmental policy, guys, we need to talk about something called environmental ethics. Ethics, if you want to think about it from an environmental standpoint, is simply the moral relationship that humans have with their surrounding environment. Now, there's three different types of ethical viewpoints that we can look at this through, guys. The first one are what are called virtual, virtue ethics. And this essentially says is that an action is right if it is motivated by virtues like kindness, honesty, loyalty, and justice. So essentially in virtue ethics, guys, anything is right if it's motivated by good. Okay? Anything is wrong if it's motivated by like greed or dishonesty, things like that. So virtual ethics are solely the actions are considered right or wrong simply by how um, they're motivated by. Two, the second one is consequence-based ethics. This emphasizes the importance of outcomes. So something is deemed right if the result is positive. Something is deemed wrong if the outcome is negative. So if you do something to the environment and the outcome is disastrous, then that was a wrong um, ethical decision. If your outcome was right, was, had a positive benefit, then it was considered right at the time. The last one is duty-based ethics. This is uh, something is determined right or wrong uh, simply by governed by a set of, of rules or laws. So if you followed the rules, then your actions were right. If you broke the rules, then that action is wrong. Okay, so we can look at these environmental ethics simply by whether uh, what the motivations were, that would be virtue, what the outcomes were, that would be consequence ba based ethics, or did we follow the rules? That was duty based ethics. Now, let's take a little bit, let's take a look at the history of the U.S. environmental movement in the U.S. And there was really three important things that happened kind of back to back to back that kind of triggered the environmental movement. The first one was the passage of a very important law you probably never heard of called the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, which was signed into law in 1969. Now, what NEPA did was that the government had to consider its actions on the natural environment. Okay, So think of it this way, guys. Prior to 1969, if the government wanted to build a road or wanted to build a waste treatment facility, it did it without any consideration of the negative consequences of the surrounding ecosystem. With the passage of NEPA, guys, now the government has to, to, in essence, consider the pros and cons of any project. And that's what they do, guys. Okay, What they do before any project is they create what is called an environmental assessment report, where they essentially look at the pros and the cons of any project. If the pros outweigh the cons, and if there's money for it, that project may go forward. If the cons outweigh the pros, then that project is going to get scrapped fairly early on. That's what NEPA did. I know it doesn't sound like a lot, guys, but forcing the government to consider what it was doing to the natural environment is a huge step forward. The next thing that happened the next year is we had our first Earth Day, which was held on April 22, 1970. 
By the way, that's when Earth Day is every year, April 22nd. Now, what this did was it essentially, guys, in order to change behavior, we need to first start with education. And that's what this did is, yes, it raised awareness of uh, some of the more serious environmental issues facing us, but in essence, at the core of this, we were trying to educate the general public on why they should care about climate change or air pollution or water pollution. That's the purpose of Earth Day. Every single year, we bring up the most serious facing um, environmental issues uh, of today. And then lastly, we formed the US EPA, the United States Environmental Protection Agency. This is a federal watchdog agency that looks out for environmental health and it has the power to punish those that break the law, okay? Prior to this, guys, prior to July of 1970, let's say we owned a business, and let's say back in the 50s, and let's say it was a, a painting company, and at the end of the big project, we have five big drums of paint waste, turpentine, some really nasty stuff, guys. We could, A, pay somebody to properly dispose of it, or we could, B, dump it and save money. Guess what most people chose to do? Dump it. Well, now the EPA is this governmental agency that has the power to punish those that break the law, guys. Now, this was so successful that a lot of states have actually implemented their own agencies. For example, I come from Illinois, guys. We have the IEPA, the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. And in a lot of cases, the state agency may set stricter regulations than the federal agency. But now we had this kind of watchdog agency that watched out for environmental health. Now, this started the movement, guys. But the 1970s are deemed kind of the golden age of environmental legislation. I want to share just a couple important laws with you. And I, and I have the year that it was passed, guys. Please don't memorize that for an exam. That's not important. Okay. But we had the Clean Air Act, which was passed in 1970. This regulated what people could and couldn't release into the atmosphere. The Clean Water Act did the same thing. 1972, it regulated what people could dump into rivers, streams, and lakes. The Endangered Species Act of 1973, what this did is whenever we saw a species that was close to the brink of extinction, we put them on this list and we protected them. One of the success stories, guys, is the American bison. Okay, The American bison was on the brink of extinction. They were put on the Endangered Species Act, and I am happy to say today their numbers have rebounded dramatically from our actions. The Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974. This, in my opinion, is one of the most important laws. This allowed the EPA to set standards on what comes out of your faucets, guys. So the water that comes out of your faucets have been tested and have met the limits of heavy metals, of pesticides, of all those things that are in our drinking water. Very, very important law. And then we have the Toxic Substances Control Act of 1976. This regulated who could buy and who could sell what we call toxic substances like nuclear material, okay, all of the, or acids or bases. Um, we have a series of, of laws or protocols that says who can and who cannot do these things. Now, this is just a scratch of all the environmental laws that were passed during the 1970s. There are dozens upon dozens of more, guys. So please don't think that this is an exhaustive list, but these are some of the more important ones. Now, at the very core of environmental science is the goal of solving environmental problems facing us today. So the reason why we have environmental science is try to solve our most pressing dilemmas, issues. Now, I have a list here of some of the more serious ones facing us. My opinion, once again, my opinion, it's global warming is the most serious environmental issue that faces us today. 
but we have other things like air pollution, water pollution, our uh, dwindling food and fresh water supplies, our dwindling energy supplies of our fossil fuels. Uh, we could talk about loss of, loss of natural habitat and species extinctions. All of these are problems facing us. However, at the very core of environmental science, guys, is the number one environmental problem, which is overpopulation. We are going to see, when we talk about human populations later on in the semester, that the exponential growth of humans, that's what, what overpopulation is, since the Industrial Revolution, is the driving cause of all the environmental issues that are facing us today. Okay. Now, I, uh, I know that uh, you're just getting to know me, but generally when I have a word in all caps and in a different color, guys, that's kind of an important concept, okay? So everything that's bad with our natural environment is the result of this exponential growth of humans. Now, here's the problem, guys. We've known about a lot of environmental problems for decades, especially global warming. We've known about since the late 70s. Why haven't we done anything to stop or reduce it? Well, the problem is, is most environmental issues have certain characteristics that make them very difficult to solve. For instance, they're multidimensional and multidisciplinary. What that means, guys, multidimensional means is that there's all these different parts or components to it. You can't fix one little part of the system, you have to fix the entire system. And multidisciplinary means is that you need the input of a lot of different people. Okay? If you want to solve climate change, you can't go ask a biologist. You would need to have input from politicians, from atmospheric scientists, from geologists, from biologists, from a lot of different people. You have to determine a price for non-market goods. That's the issue, guys. Remember we discussed that earlier on today, is the major obstacle to any economy is how do you put a price on those non-market or non-monetary ecosystem services. Degradation is often irreversible or extremely difficult to reverse. Let's say that somebody comes up with a solution to global warming. Okay, let's say the smartest man on earth, let's call him Dr. Keller, just for an example. He comes up with a solution to global warming, and we implement it. Does that mean we're going to go back to where we were before we started burning fossil fuels? No. We have done irreversible damage, guys. They often involve something called externalities. These are impacts to people that are not involved in this um, resolution. This is how I like to how I define externalities. Okay, let's say that we have a coal-fired power plant right next to a residential neighborhood. Now, let's say that that residential neighborhood does not get their electricity from that coal-fired power plant; they get it somewhere else. So that coal fire power plant makes air pollutants. Okay, it's going to re release sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere, which are going to react with water, and the water that falls on that residential neighborhood is going to be what we call acid rain. Okay. Now notice that 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 neighborhood doesn't get any of the benefits from that coal fired power plant. They're not getting their electricity from that coal fired power plant, and yet. They're suffering negative consequences from that coal-fired power plant. This is what an externality is, okay? Negative impact to people that are not involved or not getting the benefits of that interaction. Let me give you another everyday example, guys. Let's say that you go to a bar or a club with two of your friends. And let's say that those two friends get into a fight over a woman or a male. And let's say it becomes so heated that they start throwing punches or start slapping each other. And let's say you being the good friend, you try to intervene. You step between them and for your trouble, you get a fist or a slap to your face. 
Now notice, guys, were you involved in the original argument? You were not. You were a um, unaffected third party, but did you suffer consequences? Yeah, you got a fist to your face or you got a slap to your cheek. That's what an externality is. A negative, unintentional consequence suffered by an uninvolved third party. You have to come to an agreement between multiple stakeholders on how to solve the problem. So, in essence, guys, men and women have to agree on how to solve a problem. Republicans and Democrats have to agree on how to solve a problem. Good luck with that, guys. And then they always involve uncertainty and risk. Let's go back to that global warming example. Let's say that I come up, once again, smartest man alive, me, comes up with a solution to global warming. And I go to uh, our senator here in Nevada. And I say, okay, I think I can solve global warming. And they say, okay, well, how much money are you going to need? And I say, okay, I think I can solve it for $2 billion. And they say, okay, if I give you $2 billion, you are 100% going to solve global warming. And I go, eh, 50-50. Okay? Anything in science, guys, we cannot say anything in science with 100% certainty. Nothing. Okay? There's always uncertainty involved. And so we may come up with these solutions to these problems. We may try to implement, and it, the solution may not work. That's just it, guys. We're dealing with very complicated, complex systems, non-linear systems, where the solutions may be very, very difficult to implement. Now, the last thing we want to talk about is actually the most important in this introductory material, which is the scientific method. In order to solve any environmental problem, guys, we have to use the scientific method. This is how we try to understand how the natural world around us works. Okay? In order to do this, I want to go through these steps, guys. The steps are very, very important here. Okay, so let's, let's actually do this. Let's say that we were going to apply the scientific method to a problem. What is the first thing we do? We make an observation about the natural world around us. So let's go ahead and do that, guys. The sky is blue. That's an observation, right? Okay, now as a scientist, what do we want to know? Why is the sky blue? Okay, so we then would next propose a hypothesis. This is an educated guess of what you think um, the solution is going to be. Now, after you propose your hypothesis, you have to test it, guys. So you design an experiment to test your hypothesis. So let's come up with a hypothesis, guys. So our observation is the sky is blue. So let's propose a hypothesis. The sky is blue because of all the blue fairies that live up there. Okay. I realize that's not an educated guess, guys, but, but stick with me, okay? I'm doing this for a reason. We would then have to test our hypothesis. So we would have to build some kind of blue fairy measuring device, okay? Now, let's say we do that. We turn on this blue fairy measuring device. We know our hypothesis is going to fail, aren't we, guys? Okay, we know that. Now, what do we do if our hypothesis fails? Do we give up on life? Do we move to Wisconsin and become Green Bay Packer fans? No, we don't. Okay? We simply have to propose another hypothesis. Okay? So if your hypothesis fails during the testing phase, you simply make another one. So let's design a new hypothesis, guys. The sky is blue because of how water reflects and refracts light. Which, by the way, is why the sky is blue, guys. Okay? We test that hypothesis and this time it passes okay are we done no we have to retest it again and again and again and again generally other scientists in different parts of the world try to recreate your experiment now if any time during the retesting phase if it fails one of these retest guys we gotta start all over again okay so it has to pass every single retest. If it does that, if it tests again and again and again and again and again, we elevate it 
to what is called a theory. A theory has evidence to support it and is generally accepted by the scientific community. The Big Bang, the start of our universe, is a theory. Evolution is a theory. It has evidence to support it. However, a theory can be disproven with the discovery of new facts. Okay, So we can disprove a hypothesis. We can disprove a theory. But by the time it gets to a theory, it has evidence to support it, and it's generally accepted as fact. Can we disprove it down the line? Yes, we can. Now, let's say that we have a theory, guys, that is proven right again and again and again, year after year after year, decade after decade after decade. This is what is called a law. These are, this is a statement based on repeated experiments that describes aspects of the universe. Okay, gravity is a law. Okay, we have Newton's laws of, on gravity. We have Newton's laws on motion. These are things that are never disproven. A theory is accepted as fact, but it can be disproven. A law can never be disproven. Gravity is always right, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, always right. So by the time it gets to a law, it has passed hundreds, maybe thousands of tests, and we elevate to that uh, to that law phase. Okay, I like to define a law as a universal constant. Gravity is always there, guys. It's a universal constant. That is the end of our first topic, ladies and gentlemen.